Nigerians in the last few weeks have had their focus on the political space as it is election season. Also, candidates and political parties have been in the news more times in the last week than any other topic. However, concerns remain on the security situation in the country, especially as the 2023 general elections draw near. Security experts are worried following a report released by Beacon Consulting, which captures recorded cases of security incidents such as attacks, ambushes, kidnapping, amongst others. Hello and welcome to Daily Politics and Trust TV. On this program, we discuss issues around politics, policy and governance. I am Shafiu Salema. Tonight, we'll be looking at Nigeria's security situation ahead of political campaigns and elections in 2023. And we're joined in the studio by Dr. Kabir Adamu. He is a security and intelligence expert. He's also the managing director of Beacon Consulting. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Good evening. Uh, yeah. We also hope to have uh, virtually uh, join us group Captain Sadiq Garbashe, who retired. Uh, he is also a defense and security consultant. But before we commence the conversation, let's take a short break. Stay with us. Thank you very much for staying with us. And now the conversation begins. Uh, Dr. Kabir. Uh, Beacon Consulting has been, you know, on the trail, if you like, tracking developments in our security uh, sector. Uh, in the last three months or so, uh, there were this, um, I mean, hype, if you like, around the decline in uh, the number of security threats the country has been facing. Um, uh, let's get to share, I mean, share this trend with us. Uh, is it really um, going down? Because even the government has claimed that the, the worst is over. <laughs> so let's get to it. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much once again. Um, data is, mm -hmm. a, is a very interesting thing. Yeah. You, yes, you can manipulate it when you want to, but then if you use standard, st standard industry practices, scientific methods, then um, it will be very difficult for you to manipulate data. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the data does not show a decline in security incidents. Um, and that is specifically for fatalities. Mm -hmm. uh, this is because in July, we recorded about 575 deaths, so they are about. Mm -hmm. And then in August, we recorded over 800 deaths, so about 30% increase mm -hmm. in the number of fatalities. What changed, however, is that immediately after the Kuje incident, which was on July 5th, um, we saw several security council meetings. In fact, I think the highest uh, that has been held in any one month, as far as I can remember, in the Fourth Republic, um, three sec security council meetings were held. And in one of those security council meetings, the president issued a directive to all the security uh, leadership, especially the armed forces, and told them to go after the bandits and the terrorists and not to spare them. Use every power, every means in their disposal to go after them. The president also issued a clear directive that every captive that is in the hands of the bandits should be released. So immediately after that, we saw the armed forces and the other security agencies coming up with different operations, um, mm. going after the enemy, mm. unlike what used to be in the past, Waiting. where the enemy will come, and then you know mm. they will respond. Mm. Well, in this instance, the, some of the operations, I mean, one of the most interesting ones is I think Operation Forest Sanity, mm. which is being implemented in the mm. Northwest North West, yeah. and North Central, yes. specifically around Kaduna and, and uh, Niger mm. uh, states. That okay. operation mm. was specifically designed to cover a gap uh, in Operation Hadar in Daiji, mm. and then the other operations that were going on in the Northwest and North Central of the country. Mm. Uh, in particular, the um, troop that were in that operation, their mandate was to go after 
the bad, bad guys that were in the forest. Mm -hmm. So we saw that in July into August. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, in spite of that, mm -hmm. the numbers of fatalities still increased. Mm -hmm. What decreased, however, mm -hmm. is abductions. Okay. And it appears the op operation made it difficult mm -hmm. for the to threat factors to operate, yeah. to operate and to keep their um, captives. captives. Uh, but I mean, the fact that we still have over 20 of the uh, Kaduna train uh, captives yeah. still in the hands of the abductors mm -hmm. tells me that there's still a space somewhere within the north central and northwest axis that is still being occupied by these bad guys. But if you look at Zamfara as an example, mm -hmm. we saw several security forces operation that targeted mm -hmm. the camps of some of the bandit um, commanders that we, that we know about. In Niger, the same thing in Kaduna. In fact, mm -hmm. the Kaduna case was spectacular. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the, 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 the mm -hmm. commander of the GOC, mm -hmm. Div 1, mm -hmm. headed the operation himself. He led the troops. So there were rem remarkable improvement in terms of the military operations. Unfortunately, they mm -hmm. did not result in a reduction in, in fatalities. fatalities. Um, and I think that is where perhaps mm -hmm. our focus should be. How do we sustain these operations? How do we ensure these operations reduce both fatalities? And then, of course, like I said, they've reduced abduction, but then we need to reduce it even further. Hmm. Okay, this perhaps explain, you know, the reason why uh, there is um, reduction in, in the level of attacks, uh, perhaps because of the Bombardment. the aerial bombardments that have been... But what actually enabled this? Because the, the concern has been um, that of using the I mean the the, the the I mean the, the air the air components, mm -hmm. you know, of of, of the, the facilities that uh, the Nigerian Army perhaps uh, has. Um, I understand before now there have, have been issues around you know um, human rights, possible human rights abuses. How was this resolved? Because we've seen the impact of this within a short period of time. Yeah, um, it, it's a very interesting question. Um, mm. However, the answer, unfortunately, is not clear. Mm. But there are a couple of developments that I think has helped um, this new uh, stance by the Nigerian security forces. Mm. Uh, one of them is the political climate. Uh, this is happening around the electoral season, mm -hmm. um, the election season, sorry. Mm. And... Uh, mm. I mean, it's important, for instance, that a stable environment for the elections is provided. Mm -hmm. That's one. Number two, it appears the requisitory of equipment mm -hmm. that the Nigerian military has increased around that same period. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the past years, you've talked about uh, the, the example of the Super Tucano, mm -hmm. where there were clauses within mm -hmm. the purchase contract that mm -hmm. allowed us to use it in parts of the south, in the north, northwest north and north central. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, but I think uh, some of those clause clauses have been changed. We've okay. engaged with our partners and mm -hmm. we've explained to them that uh, post the naming of mm -hmm. some of the bandit groups as mm -hmm. terrorist, terrorist groups, yeah. we can now use it after them. Again, that this needs to be verified. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, there were other assets as well that were, that were obtained by the three units, that, uh, arms of the Nigerian military, and some of those assets are being used at the moment. But more importantly, and mm. I tried to hint that in my earlier remark, mm. new operations using existing assets such as Operation Forest Sanity, mm. which is a ground-based operation, operation yeah. um, was, it was introduced. Mm. So that did not require any spe pe you know, spe spectacular no uh, so assets as, as it were. It mm. was just the um, you know, insight and forethought of the, um, especially the chief of defense staff and the chief of army staff, mm -hmm. and then the re we, where, where we are at that. The third element, which is mm -hmm. also very important, is the attempt by the National Assembly to introduce That's the right. element of um, impeachment. Mm -hmm. That also created uh, a lot of national discourse, mm -hmm. and I think it pushed or created the, the, the right atmosphere for the executive to move forward to act. So a lot of things happened that I would say allowed mm. what, we, what we saw in um, July and, and all. And all. Right. Specifically, you talked about a change in tactics, for instance. Uh, unlike when they, I mean, the security forces are waiting uh, for the criminal elements, if you like, the non-state actors to strike mm. before they respond. Now they are taking the fight, the fight to them. Uh, in this, um, you know, kind of warfare, especially dealing with asymmetric warfare, um, you know, it, it has been very difficult uh, looking at ambushes and what have you. Um, do you also see some sort of changes in 
the way you know the security agencies respond to some of these emergencies so it's work in progress okay. and um because this is a public space mm. one has to be mindful That's of what right. he That's is right. he, he says That's right. um but I, I can tell you there has been massive improvement okay. uh in uh, coordination yeah. uh it's not just the effort of the armed, armed forces uh okay. the dss is playing a huge role the NIA is playing a huge role. Some of the arrests that were made is yeah. coming from intelligence, and that intelligence is pro provided by the three major agencies that are involved in intelligence, the yeah. DSS, or SSS rather, the NIA, NIA. and then the, D the DIA. That's right. um, apart from that, the police is playing its own critical role. Uh, mm -hmm. The civil defense, uh, customs, name them, immigration, all the other, 27 of them, yeah. each, they are contributing in one way or the other. So we've seen enhanced synergy among the several security departments. Mm. We've also seen an improvement in the sharing of intelligence and the use of that intelligence. Um, you are, I mean, you're aware that even in Abuja here, several mm. persons were arrested, some of them in motor parks. So, I mean, if you think about it, you know that it's, it's intelligence. How did That's they right. know that the person mm. is in that motor park? That's right. Someone was arrested in a bank, you know, mm. things like that. So all of that is an indication that there is an enhancement mm -hmm. in the usage of intelligence, mm. which in the past... Intelligence sharing and... Sh sharing and, and the usage of That's it. That's right. Yeah, okay. which in the past was not, was not the case. Mm. So, it's, again, this, it's that collaborative effort between all the... Um, the forces, you know, the security all the, the, the ministries, departments and mm. agencies mm. within the security sector that is creating this type of environment. Of course, with the political um, mm. will, I would say an improvement in political will, if I'll use that language. Mm. Before we come back to political will, you know, still looking at the fatalities, you know, talking about over 500 uh, uh, persons, you know, lives have been taken. Um, what exactly led to the rise? Because if looking at uh, what you said between April and now, there is an increase. What led to the fatalities? Is it about the operations, you know, the impact of the operations, or is it that the non-state actors, uh, you know, w w when you know they get, uh, I mean, uh, they're getting the heat now, are increasing uh, their, their atrocities, that is killing the, 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 the victims? I so, mean, yes. w what our reporting um, platform does is to provide a tool for mm -hmm. security agencies to look at locations. Mm -hmm. um, we are creating a granular representation of fatalities across the 36 states of the federation mm. so we're able to see as an example in borno state mm. that from the beginning of this year the first three months of this year it was the northwest and north central that were competing unfortunately mm. i hate to use that word yeah, but they were in terms of the figures in the figures in terms of the mm, right the, 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 the high, high high number of fatalities mm. now immediately after march mm. uh, into april the northeast started increasing and that's what is the major cause of mm. the high number that we saw in August. Mm. Uh, almost about, I think, 60%, I need to verify that, mm. was um, from the north, from the north, north east. Mm. Um, and the simple reason is because of the military operations that were happening in the north east, mm. the two major groups there, the Jamaat al Ahlis and al Dawat al Jihad and the Islamic State in West Africa province, they've been dispersed. So that anger, they are now going after. Um, helpless rural dwellers and they're killing them mm -hmm. and so that also is the same thing we're seeing in northwest and north central the dispersal of this mm -hmm. um, non-state actors has made them more mm -hmm. ferocious in their attacks against mm -hmm. um, helpless civilians that are in rural areas mm -hmm. so uh, rate mm -hmm. rate stands out as one of the greatest contributor of fatalities in the, the months that I'm, I'm talking about. Mm. In other words, that's why I said this is the tool. Yeah. If I were a commander, mm. I would look at those figures trends, and yeah. say which one, which, mm. which one is contributing more. In this instance, we, we, it's clear that it's ra rates. Mm. Ambushes contributed, I think, about 20%. Mm. Now, how do we prevent this rate? Mm. Now, we know that they are able to move using motorcycles. Mm. If we're able to reduce their mobility, believe me, will bring down the figure almost to less than 10%. Because it's how difficult mm. is it going to be for them to move from location A to location B if they are not using those motorcycles. Mm. Now, looking at, looking at the, you know, what you just explained uh, and, and, and what we've been hearing from the government, you know, is that this element uh, of, of, of is Iswap and, 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 and Boko Haram, you know, and what have you, in the north is, have been decimated to the point that they are capacity to attack 
uh, has been reduced drastically. But how were they able to regroup and, um, you know, were able to have this uh, capacity to, uh, you know, carry out raids? Um, it's a fact that they have been degraded, they have been re degraded mm. and their capacity has been, re it's a fact, in indisputable fact. Mm. Um, however, we are comparing figures. So when I use mm. um, the month of March as mm. an example, the number of Nigerians that were killed in that month was 1,400 mm -hmm. between March and April. Mm. Now, almost triple the number now. E exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it double actually because right. we're recording about 800. Yeah, so right. 1,400 is uh, yeah, well, they're, they're about. Yes. So again, mm -hmm. at, that, at that time, mm -hmm. the fatality figures were higher in the north central and north, northwest. Yeah. So we've been able to reduce the fatality figure in the northwest and north central. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we've seen a concurrent increase in the northeast. So even though it's lower than what it was in March and April, but the fact that mm. that number is still high in the Northeast has mm. now made it to reach that, that 800. Mm. But it's a fact that they've been degraded. Mm. What is um, unfortunately Factors, not yet yeah. to be done mm. is to block their ability to move around mm. and then to attack rural communities. So we need to increase protection mm -hmm. for rural communities. Um, one of the ways that is being discussed at the moment is state policing. Mm. and to an extent even local government policing. If the federal security arrangement mm. is not adequate mm. for rural areas and gaps have been created, mm. and it is this gap that non-state actors are now ah, taking session. advantage of, then we mm. have to, as a country, find a way mm. to block this gap so that we can protect the rural, rural communities. Yeah, be beyond the number in terms of the boots and presence, for perhaps of the, secure, the, the civil authorities talking mm. about the police, uh, again, there is also concern uh, with regards to their cap capacity, perhaps, to engage these non-state actors. We are dealing with terrorism, for instance, and uh, that was the reason why, perhaps, in the first place, the military has to come in. Uh, have we increased, you know, over time, the capacity of our police to respond to this kind of uh, uh, situation? Yeah, so it, it's, I think um, this current administration deserves commendation for its investment in security. Mm. Uh, however, the challenge has been channeling that investment to the right places. Mm. Um, so as an example, we know, I just mentioned that the mobility of the non-state actors mm. is largely responsible for their ability to kill mm. um, innocent villagers. Mm. Now, why haven't we invested in um, gunboat helicopters, as an example, mm -hmm. that would allow our Air Force Mm. to you know take off in a very short period mm. because an agile and light force mm. that have the capability to cut off mm. that type the of movement. A asymmetric movement mm. is what we need but we've not invested in that okay. instead especially and i say this with all sense of responsibility mm. i've seen investment in capital projects by the military that mm. i've questioned okay. you go to I mean, you go to Borno State as an example, mm. Borutaida is a university. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, our soldiers are still dressed in soft, soft skin. Their balaclavas are not high quality. Mm -hmm. They are still moving around in soft skin vehicles. So there's misplacement of priority in, in, in terms in, of in, investment. In, in, in budgeting, actually. Mm. Um, that, that's my honest opinion. You mm. go to the command center, you see a swimming pool that has been recently concluded. Mm. It is, the command center is looking like the White House, you know, massive mm. investment. But when the troops, you know, who are uh, on ground... Uh, are, are, are still complaining. I mean, if you talk to them, they will tell you certain things are not right, even mm. in the field. So again, I think um, this administration has invested massively, mm. but that investment, unfortunately, has mm. not been channeled to some of these right places. I mean, mm. if you want to have advantage, mm. we have to provide our troops with the adequate protection that would allow them to go into the field mm. with the confidence that they would they are facing an enemy that they would defeat. Mm. And I've just given you an example. Again, I don't want to be too yeah, forward yeah, because this is the public. Yeah, uh, that's right. But I, I mentioned vehicles as an example. Right. We cannot have a war situation like mm. the type we have, and our troops are still moving around in soft skin vehicles. Right. When you talk about you know the misplacement of priority and perhaps why the focus on you know I mean projects that are not directly. Uh, mm. going to impact on the warfare. Um, some also talk about the issue of uh, interest, perhaps. Uh, when I talk about interest, you know, there has been concern around, you know, presence of corruption even within the security sector. Uh, does that has a role to play in, in this misplacements that we're seeing? No, definitely. 
Mm. And we don't even need to go far. You are living witness that um, a certain mm. general who was, I think, deployed in Sokoto and was moving cash mm. that was of a ridiculous amount. Mm. And um, the persons who were moving the cash were arrested. He was mm. eventually court martialed. And I think um, mm. the, the, he mm. was, um, there was a judgment anyway regarding mm. that, that activity. Mm. But that's just one individual right. in several. There are several other aspects of corruption that have emerged. And mm. in certain things speak for themselves. Mm. Retired persons are living in mansions. Um, I mean, if you go to Cardona today, there's a certain property where you see a military vehicle deployed in front of that property. It belongs to a retired general. And you ask your qua yourself, that's a civil servant. How was mm. he able to make that money to build that, that, that mansion? Um, other mm. components are the procurement issues that have arisen. Um, so it, there is a lot of, I would say, uh, allegations mm. regarding the political economy of the funding of both counter-terrorism mm -hmm. and the anti-bandidry operations. But beyond that, we also mm -hmm. know that, um, I mean, the armed forces don't exist outside the Nigerian yes. space. Uh, right. So a lot of the issues mm -hmm. that are bordering the Nigerian state are also of, uh, bordering the, mm -hmm. um, the armed forces. The, the only expectation is that because of the respect that we have for that institution, mm -hmm. uh, it should be above board in certain areas. Right. And one of the best ways, I think, going forward mm -hmm. is to ensure probity in their actions. Mm -hmm. Accountability has been an issue, you know, uh, over time. Uh, let's look at the figures, you know, um, looking at uh, July last year and August mm -hmm. this year. Uh, in terms of uh, incidences of uh, attacks, perhaps we've seen 599, and here we have, um, uh, that's... Uh, so the darker sheet is, yes, um, it's for, it's for, for August 2022. Two. Yes, While okay. the lighter so, sheet is for July. So we could see, you know, yeah. slight improvement. Exactly. I mean, 18 yeah, no, increase, increase, that's in right. A in spike, 18%. Yeah. Uh, that is in the, in the number of incidences. And, and you're talking about, you know, um, responding to the current situation. Now we're heading towards elections. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead of seeing decrease, we're seeing an increase, increase. in terms of the figures. Uh, what, wh where is the missing link here? Um, the elections exacerbate security challenges. Okay. Uh, the contestation that is associated with elections mm. provides the atmosphere for these security challenges to, in, to increase, to increase, unfortunately. Mm. And there are, there are lots of reasons for that. One of the reasons is the engagement of um, non-state actors by politicians to ach achieve their objective. I, I was actually coming to that because it sounds somehow, in, I mean, um, Nigerians find it difficult to comprehend when you talk about uh, politicians, you know, uh, having a hand in it, or perhaps engaging non-state actors to make a statement, you know. Uh, it happened, you know, in the build-up to 2015 again. There has been concerns around that. Why, um, why is this happening? And why are we, as a state, you know, finding it difficult to deal with this? So, um, with due respect to <laughs> our listeners, I think this is one of the greatest lies in Nigeria. We all pretend that this is not happening, but in reality it's happening. Mm. I'll give you two instances. Um, and I'll try not to mention the states, mm. uh, and both of them northern states, but not peculiar to the north actually, it's all over the country. Mm. But I'm a northerner and so I would use mm. where I'm, I'm familiar with to give examples. Mm. Um, I went to one of the northern states and moved from the capital to another local government. Mm. And I encountered uh, um, a, a rally mm. by one of the political parties. And believe me, mm. I, I, I have operated in security, I think now 27 years. So mm. I've seen weapons. Mm. But I have never seen the type of weapons I saw at that rally. And all the weapons were held by non-state actors. I still have pictures of that rally that I took. And in presence, perhaps, of our security Exactly, agencies. exactly. Um, the second example I'll give you is actually in my state. Mm. I was traveling by road uh, to the state capital. Mm. and I encountered another political rally. Mm. Now, the first vehicles in the convoy were public security um, officials, mm. and then you see youths and all that. But immediately after the principal uh, person who passed, mm. there were several other vehicles, and believe me, there were youths. The kind of weapons I saw by those youths, I was self-conscious. I immediately had to check my vehicle mm. to see whether I had uh, the logo of <laughs> the, mm. the opposition political party. Because mm. if I did at that point, I think Could have only God knows a what different would have story, happened yeah. to me. Mm. So that's why I say it's a big lie. Mm. We all know that these things happen, mm. but we are allowing it. 
this, this, these youths are children, our children, mm. or younger brothers, or in certain instances, wives, um, husbands. Why are we allowing it as a society? Why have you accepted it mm. and allowed it to happen? Um, there is no part of the country. I have done election monitoring. I have done assessments uh, in support of several security activities. But I can tell you there is no part of Nigeria mm. where politicians have not engaged non-state actors Mm. to achieve political objectives. Yeah, when you talk about weapons, you know, in the hands of non-state actors, and then uh, getting a cover from our conventional security, you know, forces or what have you, um, one, I mean, Nigerians will want to know, uh, I mean, perhaps, what kind of weapons are we talking about? Are these assault rifles, or what kind of weapon are we talking about? And then the other leg of the question I ask is, why is it difficult for the state now um, to either expose, you know, those who are involved, or I mean, prosecute them, as it were. OK, I think three uh, mm. aspects of your question. What type of weapons? Mm. Um, a lot of the weapons are crude weapons, a lot. Mm. Uh, bladed uh, knives, ax oh, oh. axes. Uh, some of the weapons, I don't even know their name. I see them in mm. movies. Mm. Uh, clubs that have two sides to it with nails mm. uh, you know, stuck on, on them. Um, to do maximum damage. Um, so a lot of crude weapons like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, because there are a lot of um, youth gangs involved, there are certain peculiar weapons that are um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, popular with those g youth gangs. So mm -hmm. this cudgel, as an mm -hmm. example, this cudgel is uh, the, yeah, uh, the, the, yeah, the knife the that has the round, the, the hook, the hook yeah, shape. Yeah. And once it enters the neck of someone, they mm. just pull it. Mm. And, I mean, the person and now it's called Gary e Exactly, mm. in seconds. So mm. we, those are the kind of weapons that you mainly see. But beyond those weapons, too, there are military-grade weapons. Um, you know, the uh, assault rifles, uh, semi-automatic, automatic weapons, they all exist. Mm. So gangs, professional gangs, mm. are also there to play their role. Um, one other level that we don't mm. talk about, and mm. frankly, to an extent, they are non-state, mm. are the state-level security arrangements. Mm. Um, so as an example, in Kano, you have the Hizba. Mm. Uh, in places like Zamfara, you have, I think, mm. the community, yeah, pol yeah. whatever, policing uh, yeah. arrangement. But in each state, you will find one arrangement one or the other. Level or the other. Mm. So just recently, two days ago, the Inspector General of Police, recognizing the threat that mm. they can pose mm. to our 2023 elections, have actually banned them. I'm a little bit concerned about that move because you've banned them, but you've not put in place them, you've, you've not put in place mm. stop gaps to prevent. Mm. If, if, for instance, imagine a situation where the Hizba and mm. the several other state-level security arrangements withdraw all of a sudden, the mm. gap that will be that created, will be created and right. um, you know and the bad bad element will take, take advantage, advantage of that gap. Right. So when you are banning, you need to also need to put in place you know um, mm. contingency. Yeah, contingency. Plus, plus. Uh, so I, I do not think that that ban would be successful mm. because the state governors will not even allow it. Mm. They know that there will be gaps. Mm. So again, those are the kind of discussions that I think we should be having ahead of the elections. Yeah. Okay. Even though you are yet to answer the other aspect of it, but then we have to take a break. When we return. Perhaps because of the um, uh, importance of securing the electoral environment, we'll build on that. Uh, I was actually talking about why <laughs> it's not taking place. In case you're just joining us, the program is Daily Politics. And today we're looking at uh, security situation ahead of the elections, uh, campaigns, you know, commencement of campaigns and elections in Nigeria. And we've been interfacing with Dr. Kabir Adamu, uh, the managing director of our Beacon Consulting uh, firm, you know, uh, together we'll be looking at uh, the recent uh, uh, projection, if you like, recent uh, report you know, that was released uh, by this firm with regards to the current security situation in the country and the trend you know, it is taking. Uh, we'll take a break. When we return, we'll continue with the conversation. Stay with us.
documenting the Nigerian story. Thank you very much sir, for staying with us on Daily Politics. And today we're looking at a very important issue, talking about securing uh, the electoral environment, if you like, or uh, securing the, the, the nations generally uh, as we head towards the 2023 election, uh, with particular emphasis on the trend uh, in our security situation. Uh, we've been uh, discussing this with uh, Dr. Kabir Adamu, the Managing Director of Beacon Consulting. Uh, who has been giving us perspective on uh, the recent development and uh, trajectory. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. We're back. My pleasure. Y yes. Um, securing the electoral environment is very, very critical, you know, uh, to the realization, if you like, of um, a peaceful atmosphere or pre, uh, uh, pre and fair election 2023. Um, just like, you know, it has been analyzed, we've seen some level of uh, improvement perhaps in the security situation as we head towards the election. But one thing, you know, um, just like you mentioned earlier, and the role also being played by politicians, the political class, uh, is of concern. Beyond, you know, the spike uh, that usually accompanies, you know, campaigns, again, some of the comments that are being made by, non I, mean, I mean, the political class is also of concern. How much of this have you seen, you know, as a as a threat uh, in the current trajectory? So it's still very early mm. to reach a conclusion yes, on, uh, you know, this particular element. The reason is because the campaigns haven't started Ten, that's right. yet. But mm. the good news is that in the Electoral Act, it's an offence mm. clearly mm. Uh, to. Um, you know, use mm. negative mobilization. Mm. It's not allowed. Uh, and what remains now is enforcement. Mm. If we are clear that it's an offence for you to incite mm -hmm. violence, mm. it's an offence to use language that is offensive. It's it's not allowed mm. for you to profile, a, you know, specific persons and, and mm. abuse them. Mm. Then what remains is enforcement, and it takes us back to our earlier statement. Mm -hmm. The security agencies have their jobs cut out for them. Mm. The Electoral Act is there. It has mentioned clearly what can mm. and what cannot be done. Mm. So if they enforce that, mm. then we'd have a peaceful election. If, however, for some reasons, either mm. because their, the, their capacity to enforce is not allowed or because of the incompetency factor, they spare certain persons mm. and they would have created the environment, unfortunately, for our elections. But suffice to say, neg negative mobilization mm. is huge in the Nigerian political space. Uh, in some mm. of the state elections that were concluded, mm. negative mobilization was a huge factor. In fact, like we say in my agency, mm. we can use negative mm. mobilization to the extent that when certain persons win elections, it becomes difficult for them to rule because they would have so divided mm. the populace in the along, states, those, um, along the negative lines mm. that it becomes almost impossible for them to now rule in the states. So, mm. um, yes, uh, the laws are there, but the problem is the enforcement of the laws. And I think it's also very important that we talk about the cyberspace. Mm. Um, in the past, mm. the negative mobilization was done in the physical space. Mm. People were, were being mobilized physically. Yes, you sir. gather people, you mm. speak to them. So it, it was very difficult for you to gather a lot of people because resources are required and all mm, that. There's, there's limitation, yeah. Mm. In the cyberspace, one um, statement that goes viral mm. can reach millions of people. And mm. you'll be shocked, Within a short space, yeah. Yes, that that one statement, it mm. probably cost the person less than 10 naira mm. to produce that, that, that one statement. He probably has just his phone, he has data on the phone, he does a TikTok message calling everybody mm. to be afflicted with Ebola. And then boom, it goes around the whole world. Mm. And so that is the danger that we have at our hands. Mm. Apart from the physical space, mm. the cyberspace is another platform. Mm. And I'm very happy to note that uh, we are, we've realized that. We've realized the consequence of using the cyberspace. So there's a lot of discussion at the moment. Mm. The only worry I have, right. is we're still isolating or uh, not um, mm. appreciating the role that the Ministry of Digital Economy mm. can play in this instance. 
That's right. it, 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 it is the supervisory agency mm. for everything cyber cyber yeah yeah okay i understand we have to take a quick break uh, when we return uh, um you, you continue you know along that line uh in case you're just joining us uh, the program is daily politics stay with us we'll be back shortly As the 2023 elections draw near, remember, evil prospers when good men and women only wish for peace, but never take a step to make peaceful elections happen. Are you a father? Are you a mother? What are you saying to your children as elections approach? Have you warned them not to let themselves be used to cause violence? Have you explained to them what the consequences of electoral violence might be? Do your part to make peaceful elections happen. Talk to your children. Protect them from unscrupulous politicians who want to put them in harm's way while their own children are comfortable at home, within and outside the country. Let's join hands to make 2023 elections peaceful. This message is from the National Orientation Agency, NOAA. It's glad to know that you're still with us. Uh, the program is Daily Politics. Uh, just before that quick break, Doctor, you're talking about the need to fortify the cyber space, you know, against um, um, acts of, you know, hate speeches, you know, and, and uh, comments that could jeopardize the peace of the nation. Um, but how much of um, attention are we paying as a nation beyond just the fiscal uh, uh, space? How much of attention are we paying to blocking this uh, gap, so to speak? Unfortunately, not, not so much. Um, there is the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security. That is mm. the body that has the mandate for managing risks associated with the elections. Of course, INEC is the lead uh, risk taker, mm. owner, mm. Yes, right. with regards to the elections. But that mm. body is helping INEC to manage um, some aspects of, of the risk for obvious reasons. INEC does not have uh, troops of its own. So it has to rely on the members of this agency. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, and as, as far as I am concerned, mm -hmm. uh, I need to be corrected. The mm -hmm. Ministry of Digital Economy is not part of that interagency consultative mm -hmm. committee on election security. What now, is this? the what argument is, is mm -hmm. um, some a lot of our security departments have cyber cyber security yeah, departments. That's right. But um, you would agree with me that that those cyber security departments they have mm -hmm. are not near as effective as mm. what the yeah, even in terms of coordination done. perhaps it is needed to coordinate the response and, mm. and um, you know the, when interfacing with the major platforms mm. as an example you recall the issue the trouble we had with Twitter mm. and uh, for a long time the government mm. banned Twitter yes. uh, it would have been feasible mm. if the, that ministry had interfaced with some of the service the, the platforms mm. so that from a strategic um, approach we don't wait until things happen mm. before we tell them to correct now we are coming towards the elections mm. uh, we, we most of us monitored what happened in Kenya mm. we need to start thinking strategically that's right lessons have been learned from Kenya misinformation mm. Where a particular department or so is responsible for exactly. checkmating some of these excesses in, engaging mm. I, I don't want to use the word um, checkmating, know, checkmating mm. but engaging with this big organizations Twitter yeah. Facebook because mm. that's where the hate mes messaging takes place. That's right. uh, if we engage with them in a manner where they understand the mm. consequence of certain actions. Mm. I mean, for instance, if you profile an ethnic group, the white man who is in Atlanta is not likely to know that that ethnic group mm. that's being profiled is perhaps an ethnic group in Nigeria. Mm. But if 
we engage him to make him understand that a particular ethnic group in Nigeria is suffering from profiling and stigmatization, mm. Mm. then they would probably make that a policy. Yeah. Um, so I think that type of strategic approach, now that we're facing the elections, we, 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 we know some of the consequences, we know some of the trajectory that is being followed. If we put in place measures ahead in a manner that these platforms, Twitter, uh, Facebook, name them, mm. they, they cooperate with us. Without, we're not um, constricting the space. Mm. We're not denying the usage of the speech. All we're saying is mm. that if someone deliberately mm. posts fake news mm. with the intention of um, in incentivizing or uh, you know sti stigmatizing or even um, you know uh, profiling or or you know encouraging violence, that you, you there should be some consequence. Either you take down that platform, that particular person's platform, or in certain instances to trace it and you know prosecute uh, the, that kind of usage. Right. Uh, uh, talking about you know beyond just providing security or securing the electoral environment, one thing that should also perhaps engage Nigeria uh, is the need to maintain stability. And we've seen you know, how the trend in terms of the followership or in terms of the political directions now, that we're having candidates who are being identified with the regions. How much of a problem would this be you know, as we head towards the election? Because we're beginning to see that manifestation. Yeah, so we, we actually covered that extensively in our report. Mm. Um, we cautioned uh, that it's, mm. it's a disservice um, to the country. The fact that the two major political parties uh, mm. kind of bogged down in the two on, over the two fault lines mm. that Nigeria represents, mm. um, religion and ethnicity. These are fault lines that if we don't manage very well could mm. lead to some type, type of um, cons consequence. And unfortunately, that's where we are. The media, too, has not helped matters. Because okay. the media, too, has focused on, on the matter. Mm -hmm. and because the media, I mean, expanding e the e e Exactly. And so the politicians have responded, you know, like accordingly, because, of course, the media is paying attention to it. Mm. Uh, what it has denied us mm. is that instead of focusing on the developmental challenges that we have, we are mm. focused on these two fault lines. Mm. I mean, uh, just today, uh, someone was asking why why are we why are we not seeing the campaign agenda of the political parties? Mm -hmm. And my response was because they are focused on solving the internal problems that yes. they have. Mm -hmm. So imagine if that problem was not there, their mm -hmm. the, their energy, everything they have, resources mm -hmm. would have been geared towards um, the issue the issues be campaign. Mm -hmm. But right now it's geared towards solving internal ethnic issues, and re religious issues within mm -hmm. the party. So it's unfortunately it's a disservice. Um, it would have consequences um, from a security point of view. Mm. Uh, when you continue to tear at these fault lines, mm. then cleavages will emerge. Yeah. And once those cleavages emerge, they mm. will manifest in some form of security challenge. Uh, what role can the candidates perhaps play in this direction? We're beginning to also see the candidates aligning with those fault lines. You know, Everyone is trying to hold on you know, to those cleavages and what have you. And, um, uh, this also, some would say, portends a lot of uh, dangers, you know, to our unity and stability. Uh, we haven't seen much of engagement across, you know, regional uh, divides. Most of them are identifying with their regional enclaves and what have you. How much can they do in terms of, you know, uh, um, deconstructing this, uh, you know, as we head towards the election? So this is where we need states, statesmen. Right. We need our statesmen to speak up. Um, I talked about negative mobilization. Mm. It's uh, an aspect of neg negative mobilization. Um, uh, it's usually in times of crisis, people fall back to their the familiar uh, terrains. And what are those familiar terrains? People fall back to their ethnic cleavages, their religious cleavages, and they use those cleavages to achieve their objective. So, um, you know, et uh, ethnicity people start playing roles. Re religious factions start playing roles. Mm. Demands start coming from ethnic groups, mm. uh, religious groups to start playing demands. This is when we need our statesmen mm. to speak up and caution mm. and uh, emphasize the danger of um, aligning along this, these lines. Um, there's nothing wrong with mm. grouping and um, passing in tr uh, your demands mm. for certain interests, because mm -hmm. each group has its interests that it wants to achieve. But in doing that, let's not forget that the reason why we're together is the country. Without that country, even us as ethnic groups would probably not exist. Right. Okay, now coming back to, I mean, 
the, the current um, trend, if you like, and, and or the situation at the moment. The federal government has been talking about, you know, eradicating, if you like, um, or, you know, extinguishing the security threats before the end of uh, this year. Uh, the Minister of Interior, you know, went further to say that the mandate is for them to eradicate this by December, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, and the, the government, you know, hold on to this. Do you see... Do you see it realizing this objective as we move forward? Or what need to be done uh, to achieve this? Because certainly we need the stability and security of the environment before the elections. If the tempo of um, security operations that we recorded in the month of August, um, to an extent going into um, September, is maintained, mm. then yes, uh, it's possible. Okay. Even though there are a couple of things that would have to um, change. Mm. Uh, yes, military operations are very good. Mm. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier on, some of these operations are actually designed to go after the enemy. Mm. Um, so that's good, but we need to also take a step further. Number one, we need to block the current gap between the federal and state governments. Mm. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 level, uh, the extent of coordination and cooperation between the federal and state government is still very, very weak. Um, in, and I can pick each of the sub-regions and tell you the weaknesses in that. Mm. But suffice to say that there is need to enhance that coordination mm. between the two levels of government. In some of the regions, what is needed is to provide a framework, specifically the Northwest. Mm. We had the Northwest is bedeviled by banditry. Mm. Until date, there is no framework by the federal government for addressing banditry. So the state government has its approach. Mm. Uh, the Katina state, uh, state level approaches. approach. Katina has mm. its own different approach. Kaduna, you know, Sokoto. Mm. But, but they are uni they're, they're united in calling for, if like, or demanding for state police, uh, not talking about how they can coordinate even the state level interventions now to have the result. Uh, did you, you talked about, along th that line, the need to bridge the gap and then get the states to also g uh, get involved properly. Uh, do you align with their submissions and how can we get that? Fortunately, I'm not a politician. Mm. So uh, with your permission, I will speak freely. Oh, that's right. uh, it, that statement, mm. um, I would to, with a lot of respect to our politicians, our um, you know, governors and, and all that, I think to an, it's uh, extremely political. <laughs> and starting from the southern state governors mm. who, were, who were making that call all mm. this while, yeah. uh, if they were serious, mm. and I, I say this with, what, with a lot of res mm. responsibility, mm. if they were serious, they would have done the right thing. What is the right thing? Mm. The only arm of government that can amend our laws mm. is the legislative arm of government. And you will agree with me that to mm. a large extent, the mm. senators, and the members of the houses at the national level, in one way or the other, have allegiance to the governors. So imagine if mm. when the 17 southern state governors mm. called for state police, they had, as it were, directed mm. or called on their senators and their members of house mm. to support, to, it, yeah. to stop support mm. um, state police creation. By mm. now, would have had state police. But you agree with me that in the recently concluded mm. attempt to amend the constitution, state police was rejected. Who rejected it? in the senators and members of house. Mm. If the governors were in agreement, they would never have rejected it. So mm. the same thing with the northern governors. That mm. statement mm. is political. If we're serious about it, they would have directed mm. the house. So what do they hope to achieve with it? Um, it we're in a political season. People mm. are agitating okay. uh, for you know changes. And so mm. people will be happy that such statements have been made. Mm. And for that period, I think it will come now. But mm. I think beyond that, mm. uh, we've reached a stage in Nigeria where we should start discussing this decentralization of Honestly. security. Mm. It may mean differently from mm. state police policing. Mm. All I'm saying is that we need to bring security closer to, to the, the people. people. Right. The rural mm. person in mm. my town mm. needs to be protected. The ungoverned spaces. Yes. <laughs> Hi. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I hope we could go on, but I understand <laughs> time has been past spent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kabir Adamu, for talking to us on uh, daily politics. Thank we hope uh, to engage you more uh, as we move towards the election because of the uh, critical uh, nature or importance of securing, securing the electoral environment and securing the nation as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Thank you for having me. On behalf of our guests and the technical crew, this is where we come to the end of today's uh, daily politics. 
And you can join us tomorrow. We'll be back uh, with another topic and personalities. Until then, I'm Shapiro Salaman, thanking you for staying with us.